So welcome to Unity's Business Mastermind. This is our first session. We've taken a few minutes to meet everyone who's joining us. And if you are just joining us from out, outside the class, you are always welcome to join us in person. Just covering the details as we begin. Session one, what is leadership? Is an opportunity for us to really start at 30,000 feet. And we will get down to the details. But let's start with the bigger picture of who we are. Most of us understand leadership from the perspective of the pulpit. And, and most of us were drawn into this because of our spiritual, our spiritual feelings, our spiritual awareness, and our desire to bring a deeper sense of spirituality into the world. So the business part of, of ministry can be very challenging. We don't always get a full enough uh, education in that field when we're coming through seminary. Some of us brought business from the outside, from the mundane world into this, and it operates differently. Suddenly we're trying to apply principle to something that's been very black and white in the outside. And I don't know how it was for you when you began, but for me, one of the things that I noticed right away when I began in congregational ministry is that my day required me to go from right brain to left brain thinking back and forth over and over with no predictability. In one moment, I had to bring my heart forward and take care of somebody who is struggling with a new diagnosis. And in the next moment, I had to handle, handle a problem with the toilet overflowing in the back of the building. And that moving from one way of thinking to another was exhausting for me and something I was not prepared for. Even with coming into this with 21 years of business background, that switch back and forth was really, uh, really a challenge for me. So it's one of the areas that I put my focus as I went through ministry. How do we become more balanced? How do we take the crazy out of the business of ministry and bring ourselves to a place where we feel less reactive and more proactive? How do we really step into leadership? So that's where I want to start the discussion today. And I will um, just, I'm just going to pop right down these this way. I love this quote. The very essence of leadership is that you have to have vision. You can't blow an uncertain trumpet. So I just said to you guys a few minutes ago, I have a vision for what this mastermind is. I have a vision that we will work together for a period of time that we can move patiently through this process and that we can grow not only in our business knowledge, but more importantly, as people supporting people, that we can grow in our, in our knowledge of one another and our commitment of one another, and that this can become an important part of the support for the work that we do in the world. And I asked you, are you willing to align with that? with that vision. Will you raise your hand and let me know? I wanted, first of all, I wanted that commitment from you because I genuinely am doing this so that we can build that kind of sense with one another. Otherwise, I could just teach a couple of business classes, give you a curriculum and it'd be no big deal. But a business mastermind is something different. It's an opportunity for us to build relationship and to support each other through difficult challenges and to brainstorm together and to bring the sum total of what we have here. What is your vision for your ministry? How do you communicate your vision? Have you actually enlisted people in the picture of where you're going? That's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about what leadership is and what leadership isn't. But let's go through this on the mastermind first, just to make sure we all understand the mastermind is a group of peers who meet to give advice and support. It's a, an opportunity for you to both give and receive advice through the, through the lens of your own experience. And our mastermind group will include on the first of, on the first Wednesday of the month, an educational presentation and discussion. And then on the third uh, Wednesday of the month, an opportunity to have put some of the things we talked about into practice, 
two weeks later to come back and say, oh yeah, I got that, or no, it didn't work, or something great happened, or I'm just starting. And also an opportunity to just bring questions about what is up on your plate that you might need to brainstorm a little bit with. So we'll be meeting twice a month in those ways. We all are familiar with setting agreements. I have a few I'd like to ask, and then I'd like to ask if you have any you'd like to add to this. Um, I will ask for confidentiality. Some of you came in after we began uh, just to be very transparent um, for those people who might be watching this recording later. If anyone in the live session wants to talk about something that they feel needs not to be recorded, any of you can say, would you please stop the recording? And I will pause the recording for your question and for any subsequent confidential conversation. Our Q and A's will always be confidential. They will not be recorded. That's your opportunity to bring real problems to the table. And my ask of all of you is that we respect each other's confidentiality. As much as we want to learn from one another, the situations that we learn from need to be based in trust here uh, for us to be able to go deep into this work. So may I just have a raise of hands that you are willing to hold confidentiality in those environments. Thank you all so much. Respect for each other and the time invested for me means that we speak in pearls. It means that we realize there are many of us in this room and we will, um, we will be concise about what it is we want to know and, and still give our authenticity to this conversation, still speak authentically. We bring our deep heart and our real experience here. Um, but let's respect that we have one hour and we are coming together to learn together and be really concise, as concise as we can in, in our ask from each other. I also want to ask you to go deep in this process, to bring your real heart and not to be afraid of tears, of anger, of frustration, that, that we create a safe vessel in which those things can come. Because in ministry, what I learned is it's a very lonely place. If we don't build community to support us, it's very, very lonely. And the problems sometimes are big problems. So I ask that we engage in a deep process and that we make space for each other holding that. I also want to ask, you'll notice that I reached over, maybe you didn't notice and turned off my phone because it was buzzing. I'm going to ask as much as possible that we not multitask. I know that as ministers, sometimes something happens, someone walks in the office, there's an emergency. If you have to jump out because you've got a, a crisis situation you have to handle, please leave a note in the chat box so we know what happened. We know you didn't just uh, lose your internet or something. Let us know that you, that you have to take care of something, but give yourself and let us give each other the gift of this hour by turning off our phones or setting them away. I took off my, my uh, watch because it buzzes with my phone and distracts me. Um, one hour of your time is, is, and one hour for each other is a gift. So those are my asks. Is there anything anyone else would like to add to this list? I just wanna make sure I can see everybody's face. Okay, great. We already did this. Your name, where you're from. If this mastermind worked for you, what problems would you address and how would you change as a leader is, the, is a question that we'll come back to at the end. Um, we asked the earlier question uh, to, to get to know each other. For those who are watching the video in this group this morning, we have uh, board presidents, board board members who are leading communities. We have ministers from across the country and we have um, many of the same issues going on. The issues of exhaustion, the issues of um, management and um, overwork and big issues with how things change in, in, a, in a global pandemic and what we're doing in our world right now. So I'm going to jump out of this and I'm going to ask you to watch with me 10 minutes. Who here is familiar with Simon Sinek? One of you. Simon Sinek is a name you want to write down. 
Simon Sinek is S-I-N-E-K. He is a business leader, young business leader, and um, really quite a, quite a remarkable human being um, in the way he teaches. This is a 35 minute video. We're gonna watch about eight minutes of it. And then I'll put the link in, I'll send you guys the link and you can watch the rest of it if you want. But we're going to have our discussion based on this first eight minutes this morning. So So I'm embarrassed that I have a career. I talk about things like trust and cooperation, and there should be no demand for my work. But the fact of the matter is, is there is demand for my work, which means that there's an opportunity. It means that trust and cooperation are not yet standard in our organizations, and yet they should be, and we know that, which is why we're looking for ways to bring those things to our organizations. So I thought I would do something a little different today. You know, when you're speaking to tens of thousands of people and you have the opportunity to share a message, of course, most rational people would say, let's go with something I've talked about lots of times and I'm really good at, but I'm not normal, so I'm going to do something completely new, and I hope this works out. Um, there are two things that I think that great leaders need to have. Empathy and perspective. And I think these things are very often forgotten. Leaders are so often so concerned about their status or their position in an organization, they actually forget their real job. And the real job of a leader is not about being in charge, it's about taking care of those in our charge. And I don't think people realize this, and I don't think people train for this. When we're junior, our only responsibility is to be good at our jobs. That's all we really have to do. And some people actually go get advanced educations on, so that they can be really good at their jobs, accountants or whatever, right? And you show up and you work hard and the company will give us tons and tons of training how to do our jobs. They'll show us how to use the software, they'll send us away for a few days to get trained in whatever it is that we're doing for the company. And then they expect us to go be good at our jobs. And that's what we do, we work very hard. And if you're good at your job, uh, they'll promote you. And at some point, you'll get promoted to a position where we're now responsible for the people who do the job we used to do, but nobody shows us how to do that. And that's why we get managers and not leaders. Because the reason our managers are micromanaging us is because they actually do know how to do, do, do the job better than us. That's what got them promoted. Really what we have to do is go through a transition. Some people make it quickly, some people make it slowly, and unfortunately, some people will never make that transition at all. Which is, we have to go this, through this transition of being responsible for the job, and then turning into somebody who's now responsible for the people who are responsible for the job. And as I said before, one of the great things that is lacking in most of our companies is that they are not teaching us how to lead. And leadership is a skill like any other. It is a practicable, learnable skill and it is something that you work on. It's like a muscle. If you practice it all the days, uh, you will get good at it and you will get, become a strong leader. If you stop practicing, you will become a weak leader. Like parenting, everyone has the capacity to be a parent. Doesn't mean everybody wants to be a parent and doesn't mean everybody should be a parent. Leadership is the same. We all have the capacity to be a leader. Doesn't mean everybody should be a leader and it doesn't mean everybody wants to be a leader. And the reason is because it comes at great personal sacrifice. Remember, you're not in charge, you're responsible for those in your charge. That means things like when everything goes right, you have to give away all the credit. And when everything goes wrong, you have to take all the responsibility. That sucks, right? <laughs> it's things like staying late to show somebody what to do. It's things like when something does actually break, when something goes wrong, instead of yelling and screaming and taking over, you say, try again. When the overwhelming pressures are not on them, the overwhelming pressures are on us. At the end of the day, great leaders are not responsible for the job. They're responsible for the people who are responsible for the job. They're not even responsible for the results. I love talking to CEOs and say, what's your priority? And they put their hands on their hips all proudly and say, my priority is my customer. I'm like, really? You haven't talked to a customer in 15 years. <laughs> There's no CEO on the planet responsible for the customer. They're just not. 
They're responsible for the people who are responsible for the people who are responsible for the customer. I'll tell you a true story. A few months ago, I stayed at the Four Seasons in Las Vegas. It is a wonderful hotel. And the reason it's a wonderful hotel is not because of the fancy beds. Any hotel can go and buy a fancy bed. The reason it's a wonderful hotel is because of the people who work there. If you walk past somebody at the Four Seasons and, this, and they say hello to you, you get the feeling that they actually wanted to say hello to you. It's not that somebody told them that you have to say hello to all the customers, say hello to all the guests, right? You actually feel that they care. Now, in their lobby, they have a coffee stand. And I, one afternoon, I went to buy a cup of coffee, and there was a barista by the name of Noah who was serving me. Noah was fantastic. He was friendly and fun, and he was engaging with me, and I had so much fun buying a cup of coffee, I actually think I gave a 100% tip, right? He was wonderful. So as is my nature, I asked Noah, do you like your job? And without skipping a beat, Noah says, I love my job. And so I followed up. I said, what is it that the Four Seasons is doing that would make you say to me, I love my job? And without skipping a beat, Noah said, throughout the day, managers will walk past me and ask me how I'm doing, if there's anything that I need to do my job better. He said, not just my manager, any manager. And then he said something magical. He says, I also work at Caesar's Palace. And Caesar's, at Caesar's Palace, the managers are trying to make sure we're doing everything right. They catch us when we do things wrong. He says, when I go to work there, I like to keep my head under the radar and just get through the day so I can get my paycheck. He says, here at the Four Seasons, I feel I can be myself. Same person, entirely a different experience from the, from the customer who will engage with Noah. So we in leadership are always criticizing the people. We're always saying, we've got to get the right people on the bus. I've got to fill my, wrong, my team. I've got to get the right people. But the reality is, it's not the people. It's the leadership. If we create the right environment, we will get people like Noah at the Four Seasons. If we create the wrong environment, we will get people like Noah at Caesar's Palace. It's not the people. And yet we're so quick to hire and fire. You can't hire and fire your children. If, there's, if your kids are struggling, we don't say, you got to see at school, you're up for adoption. I want to stop right there. I want to stop right there because I want to, to give you, first of all, none of you gave your kids up for adoption, right? Yeah. It's a, it, this is a really big deal, how we look at leadership, what we believe leadership is. And I know that we have a wide and diverse group here. Some of you have many people that you're working with and some of you have a few and some of you probably feel like you have none. As you think about this in the context of your church, I want you to think not only about paid staff, but I want you to think about volunteer staff. You have, you have many people who are relying on you to lead them. So I just want you to start this morning and I'm painfully aware of our time. I just want, to, want you to start this morning by considering how good you are at telling people how good they are. How often do you actually, as a board president, Bill, is a great, is a great question. How good are you? And I, I will say this to you, Bill, because now I'm not in a church and I have the liberty to say this to, to those of you that are on the board. One of the areas that boards don't get trained in is noticing the good that is done by your ministers, because there isn't somebody over them except you who says, yeah, you did that really well. Thank you for doing that. Those little bits of thank you. And if you are like you are Zendi with a, a board where each of you are doing different things and running the church, really important that you notice the good that other people do. When people feel seen, they will work harder. They'll work harder to learn. They'll work harder to grow. They will want to be in service to what your vision is because it feels important to them. It feels like they're getting somewhere. 
I love that Simon says it's not about being in charge. It's about the people who are in our charge. Our focus can be so much, as Jackie mentioned earlier, on the little details that we miss the opportunity to really speak to the people who are doing the work, who can do the work, who want to do the work, who will love doing the work, who will really, really love doing the work. So I'd like to know, and I, I'd like us to take just another 10 minutes. Is that okay with you guys? Because we're running a little bit over on our time. Yeah, I'd like us to take 10 minutes and I'd like to know if you have a vision for your church and if you communicate it. And if you can communicate it, I'd love to hear it. Anybody can go. Just raise your hand. Cool. So what does this tell us? <laughs> it's a good place, right? Ariana. Place. Yes. Could you, this is my left brain working. Can you be more specific about that? When you say a vision, are you talking about our mission statement, our vision statement? Or are you talking about long range planning? Are you talking about my own personal wish and dream? Yeah, good question. I'm talking about your vision. If, if you have the steering wheel in your hand and you are driving this bus, where are you taking them? Robert. To be honest, this is why I'm here. To formulate that, it, it, it's there. It's rattling around and it's it wants it, it. It's saying, "Okay, we we got to we got to do this," and and I want a clarification on what this is. How big is it? And it's kind of like, "Okay," uh, and and I I I'm I'm ready and I'm looking for an answer. Awesome. So, okay. Awesome. That's why I'm here. Okay, Kitty. I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to go to Jackie. Um, my vision for um, my community is that uh, they are living in the awareness of who they are today, having released the ghosts of the past and who they were, um, that uh, the unwritten uh, mission statement is love in action. They've been the love in action church that was started by Mary Omwake, and um, that they are living that today as who they are today. Um, and, and living fully from um, what it means to be an active spiritual community, utilizing their gifts. And we have a culture of hospitality um, where people are taken care of when they come through the door virtually or the actual doors, and um, that we easily provide our activities in a hybrid format and, um, and continue to be a beacon of light for Unity Teachings. Beautiful. Lisa? I think for me, that's partly why I'm here also, because I've had such a strong vision and watching everything that I've ever seen in ministry throughout my whole life change at this point, I realized that I need to update. What is that vision? I mean, I hold it in so many different ways, but it has to shift from a building. It has to shift from different pieces. And we've made part of that shift, I know, just because we have so many people who are younger that are our newcomers. That's all of our newcomers right now. So something's working, but I don't have a vision that I can articulate as easily and gracefully as I'd like to. Perfect. Okay. Kitty? I will associate your word vision with my strategic plan, which is really kind of the first one we've had. <laughs> <laughs> it's been something I've wanted to do from the very beginning, and that is to, first of all, create a clear education plan for newcomers. So it takes them through their growth process at their own pace, but making sure that the classes are available for them. And um, secondly, making sure that there are uh, lay leaders established to handle the teams that have fallen by the wayside because of COVID. Thirdly, it's about marketing unity in Naperville um, and marketing to an online community. And 
forth. It's establishing an online community as if it were a church in itself so that all the newcomers that we have picked up through COVID and live streaming feel connected and that when we fully come back into the building again, they won't feel left out. Kitty, you are you are a perfect example. May I use that? Are you willing to have a little coaching <laughs> sure. on the, in that? Okay. So did you guys notice the difference between what Jackie said and what Kitty said? So one is a vision. We are love in action. That, that vision allows you to branch out in lots of different ways as to, you know, what, how love in action can happen. Kitty, what you're describing to me different than a vision is strategy. It's strategy and it even kind of falls down into the field of tactics. These are, this is how we're going to put a vision in place. These are the things that we need. But if you go to your community and you say, okay, guys, we're going to get in there and make sure we have our marketing set. Or you go in there and you say, guys, we are love in action. What kind of great ideas do you have? Do you see the difference between those two things? Yes. And I, we did that for that yeah. second part, the vision a while back. So that's, that's done in my mind. And now I'm more about driving a bus to awesome. actually get something accomplished awesome. so that supports what, that mission statement. Tell me in your words, what the vision is. Personal growth. If I say it in my mission statement, it's we're a vibrant, inclusive community for personal growing and joyful knowing of our oneness with spirit and each other. So how do we do that? And how do we express that? And these four plans are answers to that. Yeah, and they're answers to how to run your church. They're, they're great answers. They're awesome answers. They are the second tier to- Yes, agree. You, I totally get where you're coming right? from. Yes. Right? Second tier to how we talk. So love in action is a great, like love in action can be cleaning the building. Love in action can be helping stuff envelopes. Love in action can be walking on the streets in a march. Love in action can be fundraising for a local charity. Lo but love in action is something that Jackie can work into any conversation. And, and so she's giving, your, she's giving her people words that they can take out into the community to say why they're part of her church. Why am I at this church? Because we're love in action. We're always doing something good. Even if they don't even know what the good is, that statement is really, really helpful. And sometimes as you know, all of us have gone through the like, write a mission statement, work on, you know, work on our vision, all of that stuff. And it becomes a piece of paper that gets framed and hung on the wall. And we hope somebody reads it. We might even put it in the weekly bulletin or on our website. But that's a very different thing than being able to develop as yourself a vision statement, not, not the long one, the little short one, that everything that you do professionally runs through. Everything that you speak about runs through so that you show your community over and over who they are. Jean-Marie, I say this with, with great emphasis because it is foundational to your fundraising. People put their money behind a winning team. They want to know who you are. What is your vision? You are the leader. Where are you taking me? If you tell me this is what I can do, I'm going to try and, and bring myself up into that because I came here because I want to be part of a community. Most of our people are lonely. And they want to be part of something that raises their frequency, that helps them to feel good about who they are and what they're involved in and something that they can share with people proudly. So when, when we're able to give a statement as clear as Jackie's, we are love in action, that's a big deal. We are an inclusive spiritual community was where I came into mine. 
because my background is interfaith. And so a tremendous amount of our work ran through the lens of how accepting we are of wherever you came from and why you're here and how much we want you to bring your gifts forward and what kind of classes we offer and how we do things because we are an inclusive spiritual community. Our challenges came up when we weren't because it's what my vision was. What is your vision? That's a piece for you to work on until we come together again next month. What is your vision? In it, so write your vision in no more than 10 words. No more. So how you do that is like this. Write a whole paragraph. Write a whole page if you need to. And then reduce from the page to half a page. And say the same thing. And then reduce from a half a page to three sentences. And say the same thing. And then reduce to 10 words. What is it that you that makes you get up in the morning and go to your job? What is it for you that makes you want to do this? There's a reason, because this is not an easy job. And Christine, I want to say to you that the third most traumatic field, statistically, in terms of impact from the work, it, the order is police, firemen, ministers. We are deeply impacted by our work. We deal with people who are facing challenges, who are lonely, who are, who are facing health crisis, who have problems with their marriage or their kids. They don't come to us and go, I came to church because I'm having a great day today. They come to church looking for people and answers and a sense of safety. And there's a reason that you work as hard as you do. And whatever that reason is, it's the kernel from which your vision statement develops. The community has its own vision statement. The community has something they think that they're, they're living into. Or they wrote a statement and it's hanging on the wall and they haven't read it in six years. But they're looking to you to be the leaders and to hold a vision for them. And then I'm going to uh, type my email in the chat box and also give it to you. It is ariana at ariana.com. So it's A-H-R-I-A-N-A-1-N. If you put two N's, it will go somewhere else. And if you forget the H, it goes to, to Ariana Huffington. So <laughs> put the H in. Ariana at ariana.com. I would like you to send me the top three, in just short words, top three areas you are most hoping to get to work on in this time together. Uh, Jean-Marie mentioned fundraising. It might be, you know, might be financial management. It might be onboarding, retention, and exit strategy for your staff. Um, it might be building maintenance and care. It might be volunteers. There are lots of, I mean, we, the, the categories will come to you, the areas that you feel are most important. I want to make sure that I know what you need. I have an idea of what I have to offer. And if there's something in here that, um, that, that I know of an expert on, I want to also leave the door open to bring experts in particular areas so that we really get the best of what is available to us as we move through this together. And I wanna just say thank you. Um, thank you for the courtesy of a few extra minutes on this first session. We will start at 10 o'clock and try and be done at 11 o'clock in, in recognition and respect for your time and, and um, what you're giving here. And if we find that that's not enough time and we want to extend it, we'll agree to that together, okay? Let's uh, pray our way out and with great gratitude. And if you are a person who likes to pray and would like to say an exit prayer for us, just put your hand up. Okay, then I'm going to go ahead and do it. And if you ever want to, just jump in. I hate that, that pregnant pause. <laughs> so just jump in and let me know if you ever want to. Once again, with our hand on our heart. 
we recognize that this temple, this sacred, sacred holy temple that houses our soul is the, is the place from which we gather here, that it is this physical form that allows us to meet and look into one, another, another, one another's eyes and see the holy reflected back to us from screen to screen and person to person. We close this day in gratitude for the small and supportive community that we're building, for the grace that brings us together, for the inspiration that comes through each of us, and for the good ideas and systems and ways that pour through into this group as we get to know each other and go deeper together. We offer thanks for the freedom of time to be together and thanks for our region for uh, making space for this and understanding the importance of this. And we offer this thanks in the name of all that's holy. And so it is. Thank you, friends. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.